Hello, and welcome to a long patrol on paddle steamers. Now, I may or may not do a live later today. If I do, it will probably involve some new books, as well as the lovely transactions of the Institution of Naval Architects. I'll probably move that up, but that's basically for me to decide, you know, whether I'm enjoying family time enough that I don't think I, uh, that I uh, would prefer to spend some time all the time with them. Or whether I'm trying to get out of another game of Monopoly. Or Cluedo. Those two get very popular at this time of year. And scarily competitive. So I'm recording this actually on Boxing Day. I'm re-recording it because I didn't like the previous version. I didn't think it was good enough sound quality and I didn't think it said all I wanted to do because what I'm here to talk about today is Paddles of War and it's the introduction, it's the long patrol, it's the, you know, my normal recorded discussion rather than a live. And the point is this, there are still things which I think I'm going to be covering in further Long Patrol videos or groups uh, as time goes on, especially some of the battles involving the American Civil War, involving paddle steamers, and I think possibly some of the minesweeper operations as well from World War II because, and World War I, because they are quite cool what some paddle steamers get up to and what they're useful for. But saying that, it seems sensible to have a starting point. It seems sensible to have something that allows us to keep uh, to build from. So, doing a recording like this, putting it out today, seemed rather sensible. And for those who don't know, this recording will be going live on the 27th of December 2020. The live was on the Thursday, the 17th of December 2020, 10 days prior to, the, to this coming out. And I hope you enjoy it. So, where do paddles come from? What do they start off with? Well, if you can get it to work, paddles basically have the same basic starting point as a lot of our early methods of water propulsion, in that it comes back to the swimming, it comes back to the front crawl. Displacement methodology, kinetic displacement of water to provide your motive power. Now, swimming, pretty much anyone can do, but to do it very well requires a lot of skill. To do it consistently requires also a fair amount of skill. Then comes rowing. Rowing, of course, maximizes the force, but again, requires skill. There is a reason why the pedalo can be used by anyone, but the rowing boat, or kayak, really shouldn't be used by anyone. And that is because paddles are a way of, paddle wheels are a way of turning it consistent. In that, Yes, they might be an 80% solution, but they're a consistent 80% solution that doesn't require much skill. It's just you doing that. And if you had the ability, you could do that. Well, more. It could be structured like that, but probably be easier. But um, if you have two different ones, that sort of, that sort of allow you to go. Oh, that. that could also be good for turning. So it's all about mechanics, about conservation of momentum and conservation of a bit ability. It's about making the most out of the skilled force you have and maximizing the unskilled force you have as well. They're useful for that. 
But that's not just the only thing they get used for. As you can see, there is some evolution going on. I know, it's a scary word for some people, but evolution exists in so many areas. You have a European model, which is basically using... Uh, so you sail down the river, unwinding the rope as you go. And just unravels as you go. And then once you've reached your destination, you've done what you want and you want to get back upstream. You engage the paddles. You lower it down by some mechanism so that the paddles are now being acted on by the current. And the current itself will provide you the energy to wind up that rope and get home against the current. It's amazing. Then we have in the sort of the middle position, we have a Chinese vessel. Now, these were mainly warships, but there was other reasons for them. And that is, you can see, the paddles are oxen-powered. Yes, oxen-powered paddles. The idea was that that would help you get things upstream. But, in peacetime, That was still useful because it would get the oxen upstream and then you could use the current to get you back downstream. So it's kind of a similar system to um, our little rope paddle wheel. And eventually people get fed up with doing it themselves. The oxen are lovely, but there's a limit. And honestly, you don't like to overwork your beef that much. And, well, there aren't really enough rivers which are suitable for that kind of rope system. You're going to get worried about running into a rock at some point. So, let's go for some steam, shall we? And it starts off with this lovely little vessel. Uh, Paris Caffeine. Similar to vessels to it, little small boats for starters. It's always easier to start off with small boats. As you can see, it's definitely not got any health and safety going on there, but it's, it's going to be do the job, and it'll get you go, going up and down the river nicely. And then you build up into the proper ships. Now, the first thing you have to notice is that that wheel doesn't go deep in the, that deep in the water. Might explain why paddles tend to be a lot shallower draft. But we'll get into that at some point further. But what you can see when you look at the drawing of the vessel on the left is quite how broad-beamed that paddle arrangement makes her. Yes. And also where it makes that fat, uh, the widest point of the beam. In that it's forward to the main. And it's forward of the midpoint. Mid uh, the sort of the central uh, forward of the middle of the ship. It's slightly forward of the middle. And that again is positioned to try and clean the water and allow it to get more force. That's actually a better position for it. They did try on some ships putting it back, but keeping it forward was far more successful and far more economical, really. But there is an advantage in terms of the design. As you can see, it does leave the fore and aft sections relatively unencumbered by machinery. There is no propeller going through them, or no shaft at all. And there is also, and there's another point, no hole in the bottom of your boat. Or ship. And that can be an advantage. It really can be. So Genesis. Screw versus paddles. Well, that is the Archimedes, which was the world's first steamship to do a nice long journey. And that threw the Royal Navy in a bit of a scupper, because what do they do? So they start thinking, and they start doing a analysis. Now, 
how you can tell this is Boxing Day 2020, first appearance of my glorious new Alex's Iron Brew mug. Trust me, when it's full, it's a bit of a workout to lift it, but I will achieve it. The advantages of screw propulsion are quite obvious. Paddle wheels are exposed to any fire. Propeller is tucked away safely below that main deck. Now, I will be talking about the Cairo class at some point in this, and I will stand by what I will say about them, but it does make life a little more interesting. And it's difficult to do that particular arrangement on an ocean-going vessel. And you have to remember, that's what the RN is primarily thinking about, ocean-going vessels. The space taken up by paddle wheels restricted the number of guns a warship could carry, thus reducing its broadside. Literally, because they take up the broadside, whereas you can bury the propeller shaft and all the engine level below the gun deck, you don't have this great big paddle wheel structure on it. Now, saying that, though... There is rather an interesting idea where some smart Alec, quite literally, I think, called Alec, does try to use that scenario to mount more guns firing forward. The idea being you can have a gun mounted in front of each paddle, each wheel, and add to the, add to the bow chaser arrangement. Which is a nice idea, but I don't really see it going anywhere. Our ships weren't really doing end-on engagements at that point. But it's an idea. And theoretically, paddle wheels can, of course, be more manoeuvrable, as you can have an engine hooked up to each paddle, so you can have them doing... You do not want to know how much practice that took to get right. I'm going to give that up now. But you can do that, and that can help me do it. Also, you have a slightly higher draft. Now, why I'm using the phrase higher rather than shallower? Everyone's going, technically, you should be saying shallower. Why are you saying higher? It's the wrong thing. I'm bit. Two things to realize with academics. We tend to be very precise in our phraseology. We also tend to be products of our, the period we study the most in our phraseology, which is why I like the phrase strategical rather than strategic. And why I like the phrase recognizance rather than reconnaissance. Now, I am saying higher because, A, propellers, could, quite a lot of them at this point, could be drawn back up inside the hull, which would affect your draft. And, while some paddle wheels were designed, so that especially on a hull, uh, on a keeled boat, which has a sort of ocean-going hull, they were up on the side and, as you can see from this earlier model, not that deep relative to the hull. Some do stick down below the flat-bottomed draft of, an, of a riverboat. Some did. They were very deep ones. And some of those were actually designed as such with the idea of crossing sandbars in moving areas where sandbars suddenly crop up and then disappear. So that they would actually get the ship over it. It turned out to not always be the best idea. It, it could kind of do a lot of damage to your ship. A lot, a lot of damage. But, hey, they had the idea. God loves a trier. Their mothers do, definitely. Probably their fathers. <sighs> definitely their grandparents. Paddle wheels have the potential to be more maneuverable, as said. So, with that...
thing. But you could also theoretically do the same with multiple propellers and multiple screws. It's just most ships had a single screw. So, the debate leads to a lot of discussion. And the Archimedes leads to a lot of interest. So the Royal Navy has the Rattler versus the Lecto. And many, many other competitions. And these include competitions which are based off efficiency, fuel consumption efficiency, range, all sorts of different options. And the RN comes to the conclusion that for deep sea work, propeller is better. And this is part of the trials which will eventually build up the technology level to the point to which the RN builds HMS Warrior. So you have to think about that. But also you have to remember that this is a period where trials like this are kind of interesting thing. This is not this is pre the period where people are building train boilers, steam engine boilers by the hundred, ship boilers by the hundred, where they have standardized designs. Every single engine is man-made, handmade. And it's interesting. So these ships are as close and as similar as they can possibly make them. But they're definitely not the same. Which is one of the reasons why you need to do so many studies. Because every single engine is very, very different. And it's the reason why I think the engineers, artificers, and the stokers of this period should have been given hazard pay. Because every steam engine is basically a self-contained bomb that may or may not go up, depending on if they get it right. And guess what? They do not have a manual because no one has a manual for it. It's working it out as you go, banging with a hammer and checking the sound. Taking it apart bit by bit and rebuilding it. None of the all of them with custom pieces which are handmade. Yeah, we're gonna stop thinking about that. They are reliable paddle ships though. This is the other thing that doesn't make it on here, but they are reliable and easy to maintain. A screw propeller is buried deep in the hull and below the waterline. A paddle wheel you can get out of the water quite easily, fix, repair, maintain. Yes, it can take damage, but it's a lot easier to repair on the fly than a propeller, which basically requires a dry dock. This is why people like Commodore Perry prefer a nice paddle steamer. It helps life with a paddle steamer. When you want to go and open up Japan in 1853 and 1854, you know, you're taking your black fleet there. Well, you take the USS Mississippi, and she is a very nice paddle frigate. Because you can maintain her on the other side of the world. You don't have to worry about a propeller, the shaft, and all that stuff. You just have to worry about a clanking steam engine, which may go boom, and you can fix pretty much everything but that. So you can fix the paddle wheels. If they anything happens to go to them, you can fix the sails. All these things are things you can fix. So you only have one thing your engineer has to spend their entire time nursemaiding. So. Rather appropriately, a few years later, it was America which got involved in the Paddle Steamers War. And it really is the Paddle Steamers War. Look at those campaigns. Look at the American the theatre operations. Look at everything that's going on. You will see it is a Paddle Steamers War. There are reason rivers are critical to pretty much every campaign. Yes, the railroads matter. Yes. They really do. But 
they are not at the point at which they are having supreme dominance. If I was going to argue anything about the American Civil War, I would argue it's a river and railroad war because it's certainly not roads. Roads, they move on and bog down, but if you want to move your logistics any significant distance, you better hope a river runs through it or a railway already runs to it. And guess what? Quite a lot of your river routes have railways closely connected to them because both steamships and steam trains need supplies of fresh water. Lots and lots of fresh water. The realities of war are these things. You have the USS Cairo, a nice ironclad. She has her central paddle wheel internal. And that gives it protection. She carries a whole range of weaponry. She really is quite an amazing little ship. But you also have the Sultana. Sultana is an accident waiting to happen, and she does have a very bad accident. She's chronically overloaded with thousands more personnel than she's supposed to be. It's after the war's over, she's bringing them home, and she basically goes boom. And there are many different theories about why. But pretty much the obvious one is, of course, the faulty boiler repair and trying to keep things going. Now, the thing I would say is, in the case of Sultana, that was a risk, but it probably wasn't, uh, didn't look as, as seen as massive a risk as it might seem to us now in hindsight. At the time, as I said, I've said before, most of these boilers are basically handmade, one-of-a-kind custom jobs, and they're held together mostly by a wing and a prayer at the best of times, so it probably looked okay. In the case of the Cairo, well, she actually survives in the form, and there is a picture I have of her system. You can see the internal wheel in this picture. You can see the fact that it is very much internalized. It's very it's as protected as it can be by plate and by armor. There were some pictures which show it even more internal than that. It's actually well behind the armor, but this is from the museum and it looks well protected. Now, in wartime, that armor plate continued on and round, as you can see in the picture of the Cairo above it. But this is the museum, and it's well worth a visit, I think. It's in Vicksburg Park, if I understand correctly, although I am British, she's in America, and she's basically recovered and rebuilt. In her ordnance characteristics when she was built, she had three 8-inch smooth balls, um, six 42-pounder rifles, six 32-pounder rifles, and one 12-pounder rifle. By November 1862, she had three 8-inch smooth balls still, but and three 42-pounder rifles, six 32-pounder rifles, one 30-pounder rifle, and one 12-pounder rifle. So, you know, lost some guns, gained another. You have to remember with all these ships, though, and especially the city class of steamships, their crews adopted a very, um, ooh, that looks like it could be useful, approach to arming them, and they often had quite a lot of weaponry. And when I say quite a lot of weaponry, I mean a real lot of weaponry. And if anyone's hearing any ouches in the background, that is the assistant trainee fluffy research assistant getting revenge on my sister for having the temerity to say the words in after he's been in the garden. Terrible time. Right now. Colonials. The Nile expedition 
is one of the first examples that you find of steamships being used for the sort of massed expeditionary colonial warfare. It's an attempt to recover and save Gordon. They take some Canadians along with them, they take lots of people along with them, to try and get to Gordon of Khartoum and save him. Unfortunately, they don't get there in time. It happens. Gordon disobeying orders and not abandoning Khartoum and withdrawing when he was supposed to probably didn't help matters. The delay of communications to get there probably doesn't help matter. And the fact that the freaking officer in charge of the front of the fast moving force was sufficiently um, slow that, yeah. Let's put it this way. It was an interesting campaign, but everything that could go wrong did go wrong. However, uh, the Yangtze Patrol are doing well. They were a good, uh, they used paddle steamers because, again, you're in shallow water and also. Yeah, you can maintain them there. I keep, I know I keep coming back to this point, but logistics and maintenance really do matter in the late eight, early eighteen, mid to late eighteen hundreds, and the early nineteen hundreds. This is one of the reasons why paddle steamers survive around the world so well. They are a lot easier to maintain with rudimentary facilities. You can keep a paddle steamer going a lot easier than a propeller vessel. Especially those sort of facilities you get in, in up most rivers. In, in the far parts of the world where they don't have steam plants. As you can guess from my earlier dismissal, this campaign didn't go well. So, in 1896, the British came back. And they came back with these. The 1896 expedition, how do I put this in polite terms, uh, was as differently organized from the prior expedition as you can potentially imagine. It was... put together from the get-go as being a major operation. And <laughs> sorry, I'm trying not to laugh at my sister. She's making a lot of funny noises at the moment. The Melik, as you can see, was like several sisters, well built, well armed, and capable of doing significant damage. Now, these are not on the scale or capability of the city class that the US Union forces were deploying against the Confederates on their rivers, but they are very, very good. They are very well armed. They're very well put together for colonial policing. And their main role was to protect and provide the logistics to free up the land forces to move at speed and with confidence wherever they needed to go. Because you also have to understand that control of the water, control of the Nile, is what gives you power in Egypt and Sudan in this period. And this was control of the Nile. There was nothing anyone had that could really match it. Internal paddle wheels meant that they were protected again. But as I've said before, it's not really something you want for you want for seas. You can do it when you have a shallow draft hull. If you have a deep hull, it's not going to work as well. That's when you need certain other things. Anyway, moving on. In the 20th century, you have the racecourse sloop, HMS Plumpton. <laughs> I love these ships. They were used mainly as minesweepers, 
but also patrol boats, inshore anti-submarine warfare, and you know they were even there was a lot of them built. Um, twenty-four racecourse class, eight improved racecourse class, eight hundred ton vessels. 50 to 52 men compliments. Uh, when you realize that they have a length of 72 meters, but a beam of 8.8 .8 on 8.92 meters for most of the hull, but with their paddles added on, it goes up to 18 meters. You realize just how much wider the paddles make them. But again, why was the RN building in 1916 to 1918 paddle steamers? Well, it's very simple. They wanted to do minesweeping. And if you want to do slow speed control, and you want to have maneuverability, and you want all those things which you need for minesweeping, this was the best technology to go with at the time. If, and also, again, if the paddles get hit by a mine, they're quite easy to fix and replace. So it's one of those scenarios that the idea that technology just flows in one direction, and that is always the, the most advanced technology is always the best choice, doesn't always stand up to history. The Admiralty were not slow in coming forward if they wanted propeller ships. This is being built over 50 years after those trials. 60 years after those trials. The RN has had 60 years at that time of propeller operations, of building propeller ships. And yet, they have chosen the minesweepers to build a class of paddle wheel ships. And to use paddle wheel ships as minesweepers, ships taken up from trade. And these were good little ships. I mean, honestly, if there is one class which I am more pissed off than any other, that as far as I know, hasn't survived to this day, all the records I have found so far have told me that every single one of them has not been saved. This includes the lovely HMS Newbury. So if someone does has found something which says they else a lot there is one of them around, I'd be very happy to see it. But um I find it so sad because they do so much good work during World War One. In World War Two they mostly nick a whole load of clippers of these well not clippers of the idiot these paddle clippers paddle steam vessels there are various names which go around around them to use as minesweepers rather than building their own and again they get use of various tasks What they are more than anything, though, is a sign that the technology is still very viable. And this is not me saying that the technology today should be viable, but um, that in World War I, they built a class for the role. In World War II, they requisitioned every single ship they could get their hands on for the role. And they used them for a few other things as well, but they were good ships. Top speed, roughly 20 knots. Fine for merchant cruiser protection, merchant ship protection, uh, protecting coastal convoys. Yeah, 
fit them with a load of AA guns. You can fit a whole load of AA guns on these ships. And again, it makes sense. The Americans go one step further. Now, for starters, they have the advantages of the Great Lake Lakes, which anywhere else in the world would possibly be called small seas. And they have some mighty big vessels. This thing. The CNB. Which becomes this. A paddle aircraft carrier. And they don't just have one of those. They have two of them. Their role is quite simple. They are going up and down the Great Lakes providing carrier training for pilots. They are an absolutely amazing skill set and a force enhancer. You know, they are testimony to the level of effort which the US Navy was prepared to put into carrier training and was able to put into carrier training. The Royal Navy used an escort carrier in the Irish Sea for pretty much the same job. Uh, because they had a lot of escort carriers coming through, and so whichever one wasn't currently deployed with a convoy or doing any other operations would just get assigned to wander up and down the Irish Sea and be used for that sort of training. But USS Wolverine, you have the Great Lakes. You have a paddle aircraft carrier. Now, the fact is the US has the advantage in that these ships are already there, so they can just convert them, and that does make life easy. But if they'd wanted to, the sheer amount of money being sent the US Navy's way, they could have built them. And if they could, they could have built propeller ones. But no, they had these huge paddle steamers going free, and they could use them. And again, advantage of a paddle steamer. It is wide, so it's a small ship, but it's wide, and that is useful. Now, I'm not going to claim that they are as big or as massive as a full-size fleet carrier, but with a length of roughly 150 meters, And a beam of 29.8 meters. That's pretty darn useful. Now, they were powered by something called an inclined compound steam engine. Which had... Ooh, all such... Uh, so, uh, so many fun figures. Uh, you know... Uh, one, a piston... Uh, 60 inch, uh, piston one was 66 inches. Piston 2, 96 inches, and Piston 3, also 96 inches, for a stroke length of 108 inches. All powered by six single-ended and three double-ended coal-fired boilers. So they were coal-powered. They had a theoretical top speed of 19 knots, and a complement of 270. It's a good old ship, and it does an amazing amount of work for the US in saving so many pilots' lives, because their first training took place, uh, their first took uh, their first carrier landings were able to be take take place under relatively benign, relatively safe conditions, and then their first carrier takeoffs took place under the same conditions. And they got to do it again and again and again. And they got to practice with veteran pilots watching them. And this has a bigger effect on your wastage. Which is a very terrible academic term and terrible term which militaries use. But basically it means the amount of people you lose due to 
accidents due to the mistakes which happen when people don't have the familiarity with the equipment you wish they have and are put in a very high stress situations. And it's all thanks to these ships. Wolverine, which starts off as CMB, which let's be honest, that looks kind of like the TARDIS in that form, but it it, 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 let's put it this way, like many, many, many persons before them, the artist may have taken a lot of artistic license and exaggerating both the length and speed of the ship involved, but they went, I think, See, the thing is, for carrier operations and some of the restoring, the official speed is 19.1 knots. But I think they might well have gone a bit faster than that. Sable. They had fun. They were good ships. And incredibly critical, as I've said, to the US having the survivability stats it managed to achieve. The RN, of course, didn't just use ships taken up from trade. I know I did say it earlier from World War II, but I was sort of... How do I put it? I'm not sure what that was. Anyway, getting back to it. The RN didn't just use ships taken up from trade in World War II. But they did take a little bit longer making some of the orders. But you have the Waverley and the Glen Avon class. And as you can see, they are quite heavily armed for just mine sweeping operations. In fact, they're doing a lot of coastal escort convoy duties. Again, these are taken up from trade, though. You've got the Waverley class. They are mostly taken up from trade vessels. They're all taken up from trade. There is one which is a bit sort of iffy because it kind of, kind of was almost pretty much brand new and became stra uh, became straight up a warship. But you know, the Glen Avon class, were mostly World War One ships which were still in service. Pre World War One, in some case, they were from 1912, and they were still in service with the Royal Navy because they worked. They were very good minesweepers. Paddle steamers were good for the minesweeping role at the time with the technology available. Plus, there's also the fact that minesweeping is very dangerous for ships, and frankly, cheap and cheerful is a sensible route to go at this point in probably many, many people's minds. They're not good for the crew. Yeah. So, I hope you've enjoyed the introduction to Paddle Steamers at War. And I realise I've skipped through some things a bit fast. But as I said, the reasons for this is that I'm looking forward to doing more introductions on the Paddle Steamers as we go on with this channel. And I am planning on doing a lot more over 2021. So, this won't be the last recorded video to come out in 2020, so I won't do any sort of summary stuff now, and it won't be the last, they'll be alive probably before the end of 2020. So, I'm not going to get all mushy. But I do want to say, because some people will watch some videos and might miss others, Thank you very much to all my pe all the people who have watched all the videos. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed. Thank you to everyone who's joined Patreon. Thank you to everyone who has pressed like on the videos. Let's thank you. You've been amazing, and you have made 2020 a year to remember in a very, very good way for me. Although it does we feel weird saying that. So, thank you. Take care. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, although Christmas was yesterday. Take care.